don't have very loud voices. Absolutely not. Um, yeah, so welcome uh, to the Sydney Serverless Meetup. It's uh, really wonderful to be back in person. Thanks for showing up in uh, such great numbers. Um, so, you know, obviously we've tried our best to keep a, a few, um, you know, online meetups happening during sort of lockdowns and the pandemic and all the rest, but um, it's, it's uh, nothing compares to an in-person meetup. So it's really great to be back. Obviously, uh, tonight we've got um, Simon Waite with us and um, uh, thanks so much, Simon, for, uh, and the Microsoft Reactor team for being such a huge uh, support to the serverless community here in Sydney. Um, you know, they're always really happy to have us here. So I really do appreciate it. Round of applause uh, for all the pizza and stuff like that. Um, you haven't heard me talk yet. You may want to withdraw that. that <laughs> so a bit of an agenda for tonight. Simon's going to take us through uh, what's new uh, with serverless in Azure, um, you know, for about 15 minutes or so. And then I'm going to take you through um, how to build a serverless starter platform mostly on AWS, but there's going to be a lot of general themes there, you know, things that you want to sort of be doing when building out a data platform, because, you know, what you can do is uh, you can win a lot more with, with having a really good structure in place. So, you know, hopefully there's some, you know, learnings there across any cloud if you so choose to do so. But I don't want to take any of uh, Simon's uh, steam away, so take it away. Thanks, Peter. Um, I will try and stick to 15 minutes. I told Peter to give me the, the cut, cut signal at 15 minutes. Um, despite what the feed says, I'm not Peter. Uh, I'm Simon from Microsoft. Um, yeah, Pete's going to fix that. That's awesome. Um, I've just put a couple of links up here. Uh, Pete pinged me last night and just said, you know, if you've got some stuff you want to talk about for a few minutes, go ahead. So um, I don't have slides. I think we're all tired of slides and it's going to be a bit ad hoc. So we'll see how we go. Um, I'm going to talk through a, a quick blog I threw together this afternoon on a few topics around Azure Serverless. The first link there is that blog. Uh, if you're catching this video later, you maybe want to go and read a bit more about it uh, or you're here this evening and you want to take that link down. Second one is uh, the work I do is focused on developer communities across Australia and New Zealand. Um, if you want to learn more uh, about the Azure platform or develop, developer events uh, such as Data Engine Comp that Pete runs or Serverless Days ANZ and when those events are going to come up. Uh, if you join our newsletter, we publish that once a month via email um, and you'll be able to get your hands on that information without having to go searching for it. So um, I look after the content on that newsletter so you can always come and yell at me if you don't like it if you sign up uh, and it doesn't have good value. Right, you didn't come here for a marketing pitch, so let's talk about what's new in Azure Serverless. And I think like all cloud platforms, uh, Azure is always shipping new features, new services, in fact. Um, so there's a lot that I could talk about. So I've tried to cherry pick what I think are the most interesting big um, boulders that we've kind of released uh, into, the, into the world over the last, I guess, probably about six months, um, if I look back over, over the announcements. Um, and I guess the definition of serverless is a fairly broad one, for me anyway. Um, I think when a lot of people think about serverless, they think about uh, things like AWS Lambda, about writing code to execute event-driven uh, style of solutions. For me, serverless goes a little bit broader than that. Um, you might traditionally have called it platform as a service. So anything that doesn't require you to create a thing called a virtual machine or something equivalent to it, like an EC2 instance, for example, um, doesn't require you to choose a CPU size or a memory size or anything like that fit into what I think is um, <clears throat> the definition of serverless. So some of the things I'm going to talk about um, maybe don't fit necessarily into your definition of serverless, but hopefully fit broadly into um, most people's minds about serverless. Um, the first thing I want to talk about was Azure Static Web Apps. Um, and Azure Static Web Apps for me is a, it's a brand new service. It actually went through a fairly short period of preview. Uh, is now generally available, so it means you can write and deploy um, publicly supported web applications using Azure Static Web Apps. Um, and it combines a couple of features. So if you've been working with services like, say, Vercel or Netlify, uh, you'd be familiar with um, the sort of process that you can use to build and deploy uh, static web apps onto those platforms. Azure Static Web's, Web Apps has those capabilities, and we'll take a look at that in a little, a little bit. But it's also got the additional secret source of having access to some of the other great Azure capabilities that you don't necessarily have on some of those other platforms. 
So the way you build your backend APIs for your static web apps with Azure static web apps is to use Azure functions. Um, and you can create a project um, layout in such a way that you can put all your front end static code together with your back end uh, web APIs that are deployed into an Azure environment. Uh, and in fact, you can now, uh, with some of the recent changes, uh, even have a separate Azure function um, act as the API to your Azure static web app and configure your static web app front end to talk to that API, again, without having to write reams and reams of code. Um, there's a free tier. Um, I actually only saw this this afternoon while I was pulling this together. So you can run a, a, web, a static web app um, for free. You get three staging environments, uh, which we'll take a look at in a minute. You get free custom domain name support. Um, and you can do a certain amount of traffic on that, that web app. So if you want to have a, a great place to run your web app, um, it's a good way to go. Um, let's have a look at a quick demo. <clears throat> um, all I've done here is, uh, let me just start, uh, zoom it so I can zoom in a bit. Zoom in. Come on, zoom it, where are you? There we are, zoom it. And hopefully this will work. So all I've done on GitHub is um, I've cloned a very static uh, web app. In fact, it's not even, there's no JavaScript in it. It's literally just some HTML and CSS. I've cloned that uh, into my own repository. And then inside of the Azure portal, um, I've gone and created a new uh, Azure static web app um, application. And when I've created that, what I've done is I've actually configured up for it to pull um, this information. Uh, where are we? Dum -dum -dum. Yes, it's pulling direct from GitHub. Now, when the service first launched, um, it was coming, uh, it was only shipping with support for being able to configure web apps to deploy directly from uh, GitHub repositories. Um, so you'll see over here, this is configured. Um, so we'll click through that in a minute. So that's actually pointing at the repository I just showed. And then what uh, the Azure Static Web Apps um, infrastructure does is it actually deploys a GitHub action into that repository for you um, and will build the um, Azure, the static web application that you have defined in that repository. So when you configure up Azure Static Web App, you say what framework um, or runtime or static site generator you're using, and we will actually generate the appropriate um, GitHub action for you and write it into the repository, um, which will then be used as a way to actually build and deploy uh, into the Azure Static Web App environment. Uh, you'll see here you get this nice funky uh, custom URL, um, which obviously you can override with your, your custom domain if you want. But if we go and open that, um, oh, it's a vanilla JavaScript application. I'm a web developer. I'm a static web developer. Um, now, the good thing is that um, all I've done is say, for this, because there's no framework wrapped around it, I just told it where to find the web application source code in my repository. I still do that if I have a framework or a static site generator, and what it will do is it will pull the source out of uh, those locations and build and package and deploy for you. The great thing that I get out of the box, and I haven't had to configure anything with this, is I've now got, um, and this is back in my GitHub repository and I'm on my main branch, you'll see I have one pull request sitting there. So if I go and open that pull request, because um, I'm an elite coder, uh, you'll find that I've made an update to the index.html. Uh, and then what's happened is when I've submitted that PR, um, because of the way the actions are set up, uh, it's actually triggered an update so that, that update index.html is actually run against the pull request. And if I open, uh, open up this particular uh, action, you'll see that at the moment that PR is still open. If I open up the build and deploy job, um, and it's a bit hidden. Uh, hopefully over time it will become something that's more exposed um, to the user when they run uh, the web app. Um, down here in the output, you'll see that there is a, a link, hyperlink, and this is actually um, my change. So it's not the same site. That's the, that's the site that's my production site at the moment. And that's my PR pending change uh, application running on a slightly different URL. Now, if I go ahead and merge that PR, it'll kick off the GitHub action and deploy that change into my main site. So if you've been working with things like Netlify, um, that workflow is kind of familiar to you. So we have that capability here as well. And that goes for your uh, Azure functions as well. They come along for the ride with that. Um, so again, just a standard uh, GitHub repository. I've configured up inside of my um, static web app what type of uh, application it is. 
that tells it how to create the GitHub action. Um, we'll just take a quick look at the GitHub action, see that it's generated. So you'll see that it's got this really long, funky YAML file name because it was generated for me. And it, I haven't had to do anything here. It's automatically inserted the necessary secrets into the repository to configure it to be able to talk into GitHub. Now in an enterprise environment, uh, you wouldn't necessarily want every man and their dog being able to do that. So you could set this up once and then utilize that, that pipeline uh, longer term. So that's, that's pretty cool. Um, and I think that's, for me, the fact that you can write your backend serverless API uh, and deploy it in the same logical way that you deploy your static web app front end um, is a, you know, it's a really nice way to look at these things and the benefit that you get uh, versus some of the alternatives. Uh, at the moment, we support Python, uh, Node, and .NET um, for the functions backends um, that are built and packaged and deployed as part of the solution. If you're bringing your own functions, uh, you can do um, whatever languages you're currently using. Um, there's more, but let's move on to the next thing. Uh, Azure Functions, there's always heaps of changes shipping with Azure Functions. So Azure Functions is our code-based um, event-driven programming environment. So if you work with AWS, it's the equivalent to Lambda. Um, it's been through four iterations for its runtime. So the core runtime that is actually the thing that executes your code. It's actually written in .NET Core, which is now .NET 6, um, which gives it the ability to run on both Windows and Linux. Um, with the version 4 runtime, they solve, they've solved a challenge that historically Functions has had, which is being a .NET Core application. If you write a .NET Core function, uh, you can sometimes get collisions between uh, packages that are included in the runtime environment and in your custom solution. So I've certainly had instances in the past where functions are broken because the runtime updated and the package I relied on um, was updated. With this uh, new four runtime, there's now what's called an isolation, isolated mode that you can choose to run in, which means that if you're running a .NET um, function, it's isolated from the actual core runtime itself, which means as the runtime updates, there's little or no chance that you will see any impact on your, your .NET um, function. The other benefits that you get is obviously you then get more extensibility with additional language support because you've now got an isolated runtime with a, an API that you can code against. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, durable functions. So durable functions is probably uh, closest to what would be known as step functions in AWS. So it's an extension that runs on top of the functions runtime and is really designed for long running workflows. Um, again, written using code. Um, as part of our work to, I guess, uh, genericize some of our platform services to make them portable and hostable outside of Azure, uh, we continue to add capabilities to, to um, things like the durable functions extension. Um, and what we've done here is we've now said, instead of just having to use, say, Azure Storage, as your story, persistent storage provider, you can now choose to use Netherite, which is a, a Microsoft Research um, custom storage provider, um, which is portable. Um, or if, in fact, you want to maybe use SQL Server. Now, SQL Server seems like a bit of an odd, odd choice uh, until you understand that you can run Azure SQL Database, Azure SQL Database serverless inside of Azure. You can run SQL Server on-premises. A lot of customers already do that. And you can also run SQL Server on the edge. So immediately by choosing that, we now give you three potential locations that you can run your durable functions without it necessarily being having to be hosted inside of uh, Azure. So I don't have a demo for that, but that's kind of the two big, two big um, things that I want to talk about there. Azure Logic Apps. Um, Azure Logic Apps are cool. They're a no-code way of um, building uh, integrations between services. Um, the, probably the, the closest equivalent you would have um, to this um, would uh, be, um, uh, what's it called, Honey, Honey Code uh, in AWS, um, albeit Logic Apps uh, has been around since 2015, so it's a much more mature product. And it comes out of the engineering team that built the original uh, BizTalk server so, um, solution that we've had on premises since the early 2000s. So uh, these guys and girls really know how to do integration and do it well at scale. Traditionally, if you used Azure Logic Apps, which I've done a lot, um, they were tightly coupled to Azure. You had a designer that was in the Azure portal. There was a designer in Visual Studio, but it wasn't great. Um, with the changes that they've made in the last six months, uh, you can now take Logic Apps and run them outside of Azure. So we have a thing called uh, the Single Tenant Logic App. And the, the goal here is to, again, decouple you from having to run purely inside of Azure. 
um, and I'll talk a little bit about why why we're doing this uh, in a moment with the last the last thing I'm going to talk about. The way they've enabled this is that they now host uh, Logic Apps on top of the Azure Functions runtime, which is really cool. Um, the benefits you get out of that is anywhere you can run the Azure Functions runtime, which is lots of places, you can now run Logic Apps. Uh, the benefit also is that because you can run the Azure Functions core tooling on your local machine, you will now also have a really good designer experience for Logic Apps on your local machine without necessarily having to use the Azure portal. There are some differences between the traditional model of hosting Logic Apps inside of Azure itself versus choosing the single tenant model. But the benefits are that, again, you can build that Logic App once and then host it in um, lots of different locations, um, which is a common ask that we see from um, our bigger customers uh, that are either hybrid cloud or multi-cloud. Uh, Azure Container Apps, I've got, I got two more to go, Pete. I don't know how I'm doing for time. Um, Azure Container Apps, um, everyone's favorite topic. I promised Peter I wouldn't say the word Kubernetes, but I'll say the word Kubernetes. Um, Azure Container Apps uh, use Kubernetes, but you wouldn't know it. So when you create an Azure Container App, uh, let's have a look at one. Uh, you create what's called a Container App Environment. Okay, so you can think of a Container App Environment effectively as a Kubernetes cluster, but you don't see Kubernetes. It's, it's masked, masked from you. And then when you create your Container App, uh, you get some uh, Kubernetes-like capabilities come along for the ride. So if you look here on the settings, you'll see you've got uh, secrets, ingresses, um, and then further down the screen, you've actually got uh, revision management as well. So revision management probably is more something that you might see using something, something like Spring Cloud, um, which gives you the ability to do revisions of your application as you build and deploy it, uh, whereas ingresses is a fairly common um, structure that you would use to allow traffic into a Kubernetes cluster, and secrets is the way that Kubernetes manages secrets, um, which aren't really secrets because they're just base64 encoded strings, but that's another, another talk. We can give it another time. Um, I've got a really simple application. It's just a container, again, coming out of a, um, a Microsoft sample container registry. Um, it will load eventually. I think it's gone to sleep because I haven't been using it. Um, container apps are good because they can scale to zero. So when you've got no load on your container app, you're not generating any costs apart from some storage costs. You're not paying for compute that you might be um, uh, not actually utilizing at that point. You can do some of these things with a full-blown Kubernetes cluster. If you've got the capabilities already, you're probably running this stuff on Kubernetes and not container apps. However, if you're starting into this world of containerization, uh, microservices and Kubernetes, this can be a really quick and simple way to get going because you get service discovery, traffic splitting, um, and the ability to do microservices using uh, Dapper, which is our uh, microservices framework that allows you to write microservices in any language, and then we kind of take care of all the plumbing work for you. In fact, we don't even do it. It's an open source product these days. Uh, and we manage the scaling using another open source product from Microsoft called uh, Keta, um, which uses event signaling to drive um, the, the increasing number of pods that you would typically inside, inside of Kubernetes, but that's all hidden from you in the container apps world. Um, the obvious question is, why would I use container apps uh, over something else? And that is a very good question. I'm not going to go into it this evening, but the blog goes to our official guidance on how to choose the right solution for hosting um, you know, the, the software that you're writing. Um, and I think um, our friend Corey Quinn, who's a, a, a big, uh, big uh, friend, shall we say, of AWS, says that they've got, you know, was it 17 different ways of running containers? Well, we're, we're going there as well. We've got, you know, probably 17 different ways of running containers as well. So 17 different ways of shooting. So I don't know about that. You know, definitely containers can be, um, they can be a bit of an elephant gun if you're not careful. All right, last one. Um, again, I said I wouldn't say Kubernetes, but it's there on the screen. Um, the reality is, is for a lot of larger customers, hybrid cloud, multi-cloud, uh, is the way they want to go. Trying to build true multi-cloud or hybrid cloud without having a common set of uh, infrastructure components to do that with is really difficult. Azure Functions, for example, has been able to run in lots of different places for a while with some restrictions. But if you want to do anything at scale and have a consistent management experience, it's been really difficult to do that. Um, we now have a, a product which is called um, Azure Arc. Um, where are we? Azure Arc, um, Azure, Azure Arc enabled uh, application services. That's a nice tongue twister for you. But effectively what we've done is we've taken 
um, Azure App Services, which is a combination of web apps, uh, Azure Functions, Azure Logic Apps. Um, and we've made that an, as, as an extension that you can deploy into any CNCF compatible Kubernetes cluster um, that you can manage via Azure Arc, which is our management plane that gives you the ability to have a consistent view of all Kubernetes clusters you have regardless of wherever they are. You deploy this extension into the Kubernetes cluster and effectively what it does is it gives you Azure App Service on Kubernetes, wherever that Kubernetes cluster is, whether it's on-prem, AWS, uh, GCP, you get the ability to write your code using Azure Functions or web apps or logic apps and deploy it to any of those locations with a consistent model using a consistent Azure Resource Manager API and having a consistent management experience uh, through the portal. Um, it's still in preview, um, but it's a really interesting proposition and it goes alongside a bunch of other uh, Azure Arc managed services. So all of our data services in Azure can also be deployed uh, using the, um, the Azure Arc data uh, services extension. So you can do things like deploying the Azure SQL database uh, down into um, Kubernetes. Azure uh, Event Grid is also available on Kubernetes. Azure API management is also available on Kubernetes as well. So you can kind of see where we're going here. And it's really just meeting our customers where they are, which is them saying to us, we love your technology, but we need a viable DR proposition that, that maybe is not on your platform. It might be in our own data center or it might be in um, another cloud provider's data center where they're running Kubernetes. So I think it's an interesting proposition, probably too low level and, and infra focused, I think for a developer audience, but I think it's important to, to know about um, because for me, it gives me confidence that if I build using any of these services on top of Azure, that I have a, a viable way to take them elsewhere uh, longer term as well. So that's pretty much it from me. Um, I do have, um, and I know Pete's going to get started soon. Um, I'm going to show you something really quickly. Everyone got their cameras, cameras ready? Um, where are we? It's, it's here. It's going to slide it on the side of the screen here slowly. Bit like Jaws, dum 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 dum. All right, so I've got. Whoa! Oh no, it's there. Um, so that's the URL. Uh, if you go to that URL, the first five people that go to that URL, there's a hundred dollars USD uh, Azure credits um, for you to redeem there, um, and that will basically um, be val available for you uh, for the first five people, and it's valid for ninety days from today. So $100 USD. So even if you don't use Azure today, uh, you can rock up and um, redeem that pass and get an Azure subscription to do to do your worst with up to $100 US dollars or to 90 days, whichever one comes first. Uh, you may well run afoul of things if you try and do bit, large scale Bitcoin mining in Azure. There's <laughs> It's a, it's a pretty well-known pattern of services that get lit up to do that sort of stuff. But, you know, if you want to burn 100 bucks on a GPU VM running for 30 minutes to generate, I don't know, 0.0001 ETH, uh, you go for it. Um, personally, I think it would be a waste of that opportunity. But um, assuming that we don't shut it down because we recognize it as Bitcoin mining, um, yeah, the offer's there. So first five people, if you are watching the video later, sorry, you probably missed out. but um, Rest assured, we'll have other other offers later on. That's it for me, folks. Um, I'm hanging around, not going anywhere. So if you've got any questions, feel free to grab me later and we can talk about them. Good to see some faces back in person. Uh, hopefully everyone's feeling comfortable about that. And um, yeah, Pete, you can come up and take us on a journey. Thank you, Carly, sir. No Just remember to turn off your mic before you <laughs> head to the bathroom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's a story that you don't want to forget. That wasn't me, by the way, for anyone watching the video later. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. I'm just going to take one second to get all set up. Come in here, Peter. Oh, yes, we've got the ability to do this. That's good. having to use my second computer because um, I need my primary computer for the live stream, which is um, always interesting. 
I discovered with StreamYard that if you disconnect your primary computer, everything still keeps on working. Ah. Yeah. Ask me how I, how I found out. <laughs> I had a power cut at home in the middle of a stream with a guest, and the guest didn't even know I'd left. So they probably, they probably just would have kept on talking had I not been able to rejoin. Literally a two-second brownout caused everything in the house to go dark. And uh, my guest was like, ah, oh, you're back. Where did you go? It's coming. It's coming. Sorry, folks, on the live stream. I will get into, uh, get organized eventually. Actually, Simon, have you got the link handy? Um, can you read it out to me or something like that? Technology, it's hard. Oh, I'm on stream. Yeah, tank stream. Um, I'm on the tank stream Wi-Fi as well. That's probably half my problem. Is there a Microsoft? Yeah, it should be Reactor, Reactor Sydney. Ah, uh, yeah. And um, what's the username and password? Uh, I don't. Uh, yes, it's Reactor Sid. Uh, Reactor Sid at Microsoft. <laughs> really? Yeah. Uh, continue. Maybe my hotmail will, uh, my Gmail will uh, get it. It's here, you want it? Oh, I got it, yeah. Yeah, you got it. Cool. Now I will. Okay. Gosh. All right, not hearing myself twice. How did you go, Simon? You're all set. You don't have my. Okay. Yeah, I know. It's just that I'm on my uh, spare computer. Oh, gosh. Screen recording. Um, I just need to update the permissions on my, so, display, security and privacy, where is that, there we go.
screen recording. Google Chrome. Okay. Sorry, folks. I'll be back on in a second. This is how long ago I updated this. Um, Dreamyard. <laughs> Slightly awkward, but uh, cool. Share screen. Need a viable second computer. That's what tonight's taught me. Cool, sorry about that, folks. Um, so, yes, um, hopefully you can all hear me on the live stream and thanks for your patience. Um, so, my name's Peter Hansons. Um, I'll tell you a bit about my journey in a second, but um, I founded a, um, a new data cloud consultancy called Cloud Cedar with a couple of colleagues. Um, so that's kind of what this whole thing is. The story about behind cloud seeding, it's actually done um, out in, up in Mount Kosciuszko. They, they actually release some gas in the clouds to increase precipitation uh, for the Snowy Hydro project. And the whole idea is that, you know, the more it rains up in the mountains, it fills up these big lakes and stuff like that. And that's effectively the battery storage and they release it at night to generate electricity through the turbines and stuff like that. But, so? Yeah, that, that's just what they do. They, you, you can Google it, yeah. It's, um, but effectively the whole model of the story is it makes um, clouds more effective and, you know, and increases the output of uh, the Snowy Hydro project. and. We thought that's what we want to do for our customers as well. Okay, so I'll switch over. Apologies for that. But anyway, here to talk about a serverless data platform. A bit about my journey. Um, I did data for many years in financial services um, and then uh, did a few cloud courses and was lucky enough to get hired by um, a cloud guru to, as their first data hire, set up all of their data engineering and stuff like that. Then did a few uh, cloud engineering and uh, solutions architecture roles, and then um, uh, managed to set up my own little consultancy called Cloud Shuttle um, that uh, kept me out of trouble um, in between meetups and conferences and stuff like that. And I did a lot of you know sort of uh, cloud and data architecture type work, setting up data platforms and, and things like that. And now at Cloud Cedar, I do a bit of sales, solutions architecture, and data, but obviously you're always serverless first. So uh, to keep this data platform a little bit focused, it's always good whenever you're undertaking, you know, um, a new data platform build and stuff like that, that you have a, a, a why, a, a purpose to it all. And my purpose in particular is that I run a lot of community events and stuff like that. Uh, we've been very disconnected because of COVID and the like. Um, and, um, you know, I've got all of this data that's coming through from Meetup, MailChimp, Slack interactions and things like that. And I thought, why not put all of this together into a data platform and see if I can sort of connect, help use it to connect like-minded individuals that might benefit from, you know, bouncing ideas off one another. A bit like how you would in a face-to-face -face Meetup where you're kind of discussing sort of different patterns that you might be using at work and things like that. So that's basically the business problem. I want to extract a whole bunch of data out of these um, SaaS apps and things like that, um, you know, ticketing, all of these sorts of um, interaction type data to get a bit of analysis done. And another why or question that you might have is 
why do this in a data lake? Why not do it in a traditional uh, data warehouse? Because they've been doing things pretty well for, you know, 40, 50 years or whatever it is. Um, and the reason for that is there's a lot of data out there, data warehouses, as much as they've come down in price, um, you know, they're still reasonably expensive. Um, open source projects like Presto that's now become Trino has kind of helped separate that storage from compute um, so that you can sort of use serverless uh, SQL engines and have your data stored in an object store, um, you know, whether it's S3 on AWS or the alternatives on other clouds and stuff like that. It's incredibly cheap. You can just store as much data as you possibly want. Um, so it makes a, a hell of a lot of sense to go down that route. Then you might be asking why serverless? Well, data is a pretty complicated space. Um, you know, traditionally, um, we've had a lot of challenges with uh, the tight coupling of uh, compute to storage. It's been tough to scale. It's very costly to scale. And, you know, like you, you go, you know, it used to be, um, you know, $70,000 per terabyte, uh, you know, if you wanted to add in some extra storage on a, you know, terabyte where a teradata warehouse or something like that, you know, incredibly costly. And um, so uh, this ability to sort of have this low cost uh, scalable solution um, just seems incredibly attractive uh, to me um, because data is, does struggle a lot with um, uh, scaling. But um, a bit like sewage, data is, is often something that needs to go through multiple stages of uh, purification before it's business ready. It's a bit like, you know, these various sewage ponds, um, you know, the raw data that you get out of applications isn't generally ready for business consumption. You kind of need to um, step it through a few treatments before releasing it out into um, the open sea, uh, ready to sort of find its way back into the ecosystem, if you will. And typically what you find in that sort of tiered structure in data is you've got unrefined data coming in, you go through a refinement process and then it's business ready. Um, I think uh, if you look at um, uh, Databricks, they've got this uh, bronze, silver and gold um, tiering. Uh, you can think of it as perhaps, you know, raw data coming in as JSON, uh, CSVs and text files. Uh, then you're converting it into like a columnar format, such as Parquet, and then uh, um, into Iceberg and Delta Lake ready for consumption. You could also conceptualize it as uh, application data that gets converted into business domains, and then uh, after that into aggregations and metrics. Another consideration to think about is data classification on landing. There's oftentimes, with how cheap, uh, you know, object stores are, that, you know, you can just kind of throw it all in there and it's, you know, it's all good. And, you know, there's been quite a few, quite a few of the cl major cloud providers have had, you know, um, I guess, have been in the news over the years for, you know, inadvertent data leaks, not so much by the cloud providers themselves, but you know, actual customers, because perhaps they've just thrown all of this data into this bucket, forgotten about it, changed the security permissions, or you know, inadvertently, and it got leaked. And so, being very intentional about where you're storing your data, um, and having um, you know a, a classification of that data, and for smaller companies. Uh, that aren't in regulated industries, um, having a three-tier uh, classification usually works, public, internal, and restricted. Think of public data as being sort of like ABS statistics. You can get them anywhere, so you're really not too fast if they get out of your business. It's not a huge issue. Um, internal data, think about application logs and things like that. Not super sensitive, but you probably wouldn't want your competitors knowing about it. 
And then restricted data, think about sort of personal identifiable information, you know, card data or health information and things like that. You, you know, there's a huge reputational uh, risk associated with just letting that data uh, leak from your company. And so the benefit of doing something like this is twofold. It's that the people putting data into your data lake, you know, are sort of confronted with this question, well, what is my, how is my data classified? And, you know, and uh, where should this data go? A lot of companies end up dumping it all into restricted because they're like, well, I'm not too sure, so I better play it safe. But, um, you know, at, at least, you know, they're, they're sort of um, having to think about that a little bit. But then also when people are accessing that data, it's like, oh, this is coming out of the public bucket. So, you know, it's probably don't need to stress too much about it versus something that's coming out of the restricted, need to take a lot of care. Cool. Tagging data, this is another big one. So basically, um, when you're loading your data into your data lake, it's, it's often hugely important, uh, especially for business users looking at the data to be able to understand a little bit about what's going on in there. So, um, for instance, great tags to have is the source application where it's coming from. So if it's coming from MailChimp or meetup.com or Slack or, you know, one of the various other, you know, source applications, I'm, I'm just using a convoluted uh, example here, but, you know, you might have internal databases and the like that have names and it's good to put that in as a tag. Also the geography, because there could be certain privacy laws that you needed to adhere to, GDPR in Europe and things like that. That's always really useful. Um, other tags is just um, whether that data does contain PII data. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's a few other types of tags that you might want to add in as well, such as whether this is a, a stream whether it's an incremental or whether it's a, a batch load. And that sort of informs you how you can sort of restitch that data when you're doing your data engineering. Um, so once you've got all of your tag data, uh, your data classified, tagged, um, segregated in the right spots, and then you know, you've begun to uh, get that data into a, a bit of a, um, a columnar-based file format, you want to start looking at uh, now sort of grouping that data into particular de domains. This is a lovely uh, um, town on an island near Venice called Burano. Uh, they, it's famous for having each of the houses distinctively coloured. Thought it was a, I couldn't find a really good image that spoke to domains very well, and I thought maybe this might might be the one. Um, but effectively, what you find is that you've got different application domains uh, contained in these various application sources. So you might have customer information both in MailChimp, in Slack, and, and, and maybe that's where that customer is mastered from. And so when you're bringing in that data, and you might have um, interaction domains or event domains or marketing domains. And so as you're bringing in all of that data, it pays to really sort of start uh, pulling, you know, sifting out those domain events into their separate domains. Not everyone is building their applications in a domain-driven design. And so it makes, uh, you know, and, and oftentimes a lot of us are working in you know, large enterprise type environments where they've got a million different um, source applications that you're having to deal with to, to sort of bring that all together. So it probably comes together a little bit better in this slide. So you've got your source applications there, you're classing it, classifying it into the different buckets. Um, if you're on AWS, you'll be using glue jobs to convert it into Parquet and then um, put that data into raw. Um, then what you want to do is run crawlers to get uh, the 
to populate the data catalog, to discover the schema, make sure that that data is understood, what sort of columns and uh, data types are in there. And then you want to start building out these glue jobs to start parsing all of these data into domain events. So uh, we've got a, a customer there, um, event data, uh, customer interactions, and perhaps in this case, you know, like ticketing and, and the like, if you will. And then that goes into staging, ready for handoff to uh, the uh, data warehouse developers and business analysts. So with all this talk about domains, um, not sure if you've heard, but you, you might be asking, is this where I say the word data mesh or start talking about data mesh? And it most certainly is. So this is a Mark Dagani, she works at uh, um, ThoughtWorks um, and data mesh is kind of all the rage um, at the minute. Uh, it's, it's, you know, if you're familiar with Kubernetes, you might think of it as a bit of a, a side cart or a, um, uh, for your container where you sort of doing that sort of platform engineering piece, but for, for data. And there's this an acronym called um, DATSIS, which stands for discoverable, addressable, trustworthy, self-describing, interoperable, um, and secure data. And um, on the, uh, in the AWS ecosystem, um, what you want for discoverable data or discoverability is you want a data catalog. And in AWS, you've got the glue catalog. Uh, and then you want to have addressable data. So a way to actually get at all of that source data. And again, in, in, in AWS, you've got lake formation tables. So you can have all of these uh, dispersed domains, but um, all addressable at, at a single time, able to be brought together. Trustworthiness of the data. Now, that's definitely a deeper discussion. I could probably write a book on that one um, over my, you know, my 15 years working in data, but I, I've got some open source projects that I'll share with you on that front. Self-describing data. Now, this is where I was mentioning the data tags. Tagging your data is incredibly important. And it's, you know, it's just like your unit tests and integration tests for your applications. Uh, you, you know, this is really, you know, eating your vegetables type stuff when it comes to data. Interoperable, so being able to actually get at all of this dispersed data, uh, you've got Athena. And, um, and that's basically Presto, Trino, so a, um, uh, a serverless, uh, at, if you build it that way, um, SQL engine, so that just sort of scale, takes away uh, the scaling aspect for you. And then um, secure. So this is a very interesting one, um, which is one of the major benefits of using data tags is that oftentimes role-based access can be very unwieldy. You know, you need to build these roles for particular teams and, um, you know, you never really know how many people have got that role and whether they're the right people to have that role and things like that. In data, it becomes a bit more important, if you will, because, you know, for instance, say PII data, things that contain email addresses and, and the like, really, for most folks, they don't, they've got no business knowing that and, and having access to that sort of data. Really, you just want your marketing team to have access to that data. And so utilizing tag back based access, um, you can kind of go, well, no, I only want, you know, uh, PII data available to my marketing folks and no one else. And financial data for my finance folks, no one else. HR data, and the list goes on. So actually sort of putting, to get, putting together this structure um, can be quite a powerful um, thing that can pay dividends in a lot of different areas. Um, you know, and I, I wanted to call out that, you know, obviously 
you can achieve these patterns you can achieve on various different uh, data platforms. It's not just uh, the one that I'm showcasing here tonight, but um, you know, so you know, there's some really good, hopefully, some good take home lessons um, for you tonight. Now, um, this image is all about ownership. Now, um, obviously, we've got this lady, she's standing very proudly in front of her storefront. Um, and I'm pretty sure she'd know, you know, all of the products in the store and, you know, what, what sort of condition the inventory and all of this sort of thing. And this is what we need for, for data. Um, you know, when you've got a team that's kind of um, built out a bunch of stuff in, I don't know, MailChimp and the like, maybe it's the marketing team, that, that, that marketing team actually owns that data, the end-to-end -end life cycle. Oftentimes what you get in development teams is there's this handoff to the data engineering team and it's just like, oh, I don't know what happens to it after that, you know, and um, it's actually kind of one of the main reasons why data mesh has come to the fore, in fact, because um, first of all, uh, poor old data engineering teams have become a massive bottleneck for organizations. Um, and that, uh, and that um, they just lack the context, especially in larger organizations that, uh, you know, like you've got these microservices teams that literally just spawn up and build more and more microservices. Um, and then, you know, they disband and go and form new teams and build more microservices. And all of the context around that microservice is lost and it's up to the data engineer to sort of figure it out after the fact. And um, that can be quite a massive challenge. And so that's, it's this data, uh, this uh, data ownership that um, allows for data platform engineering where you can sort of move the uh, responsibility for owning that end-to-end -end life cycle of the data from, um, a centralized data engineering team and, and put it back onto the microservices team that they can sort of start taking ownership just in the same way as you might have a templatized way of building out a microservice. So for instance, if you're on the AWS ecosystem, you might have a single table design with, um, you know, using AppSync for your GraphQL methods um, and, you know, that single API um, in front and, and basically the microservices team needs to just develop some more uh, methods, add it to the front end and Bob's your uncle, you're done. In a similar vein, when you're, when you're sort of getting your microservices team to start, um, I guess, uh, ingesting data into the data platform, it's, there, there can be a YAML spec where perhaps you're using Firehose to land the data. You might be taking events from, um, I've got event grid on my head, which it's, it's event bridge, isn't it? They're too similar between the two clouds. But um, say, you know, you might have event, uh, uh, event bridge as your event brush and um, you're offloading those events by Firehose into S3, but it's not just simply left there where the sort of uh, microservices team finish, they also continue on with the transformation, splitting out their application data into the various domains like customer, you know, interactions, um, say, uh, you know, all, you know, um, orders, purchases, that, those transactions and the, and the like. And this, and, and also populating the catalog, adding the tags and things. So you take, take away a lot of this work off the data engineering team, put it back to the people who actually have the context, and then really the data engineering team become the data platform team. Um, and then there's this really nice handoff to the, uh, the analytics teams and things like that, that can actually use the data quite easily now um, and build these metrics and semantic layers um, and presentation layers with the data, also machine learning use cases, because once your data actually is in those domain events, you know, 
like when I, if I just hand you some random uh, application data, you know, that may or not, may not have very good column names and the like, you know, that, that requires a lot of effort on your behalf to actually um, understand that data versus actually sort of handing off domain events. Like this is a, a customer object and, you know, here you go, you know, go away and do something with that. You know, it's, it's understood data, it's domain events. And, and, you know, your analytics team can, you know, go off and actually do their thing with um, a lot greater ease. So obviously, once you've got all of this, you know, then the famous question is, uh, can I even trust this data? And it's, um, it's, it's definitely a common question. If I had a dollar for every time, I was asked if I could, if someone could trust this data that I, I put to them, I'd be retired already, um, but yes. Um, it's, it's a big question and there's lots of uh, testing and observability frameworks coming out in open source. There's Great Expectations Data, Soda SQL, uh, DBT uh, templating and the like is, is another one. And then there's also Monte Carlo Data is a uh, paid version of all of that. So um, I was going to um, uh, talk you know, further on all of this stuff tonight, but I think probably, you know, it's been a long enough evening uh, so far anyway. But um, that's kind of, I guess, hopefully some take home lessons. There's a lot you can do building out serverless data lakes on AWS. And in fact, any cloud or data platform, you know, Snowflake pretty much is completely serverless. So um, I think if there's any take home message, that I wanted to impart with you folks tonight is really that, um, you know, you should be thinking about whether or not to build serverless, serverless data platforms. You should be thinking serverless first data platforms. You'd be nuts in my opinion uh, to do anything else. So um, any questions? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but again, that that requires a bit of effort on the application development team, and I guess time poor application development teams. You might say, um, you know, what they really want is just a quick, easy pattern like a YAML file that they populate and go, okay, you know, here's how I can convert my application data into domain events, um, you know, in a very sort of simple light touch way. Um, I've, I've worked with big enterprise customers where they're just like flat out, you know, like they've got a JIRA board and backlog <laughs> longer than war and peace. And they're just like, yeah, mate, probably get to it in the next two years at some point, you know, but yeah, it's not going to happen. Yeah, but who's doing this? <laughs> yeah. So what are the requirements we have for our modern campuses? So in other words, a tenant that says platform, the way you see their slice of the data. Uh, I've got into a data tags, a metric control issue that's got in there, and that's the APS that they can run on the first slide. I think that would be, yeah, that would be a really great use case for, uh, you know, data tags, in fact. So data tags would be like the data instance level, not the technological schema level. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, yeah, I always encourage, like, I can't answer, like, absolute specifics in your use case right now, but I guess that's kind of why I did this presentation in the first place, because... I think oftentimes data projects, just like development projects, um, it's really like if you get the structure right, um, you, you really sort of put in a lot of thought up front about sort of the different nuances about your business use case, then, um, you know, you've, half the battle's already won. Um, you know, if you can spend a couple of weeks up front, 
you know, diving deeply into that. I think there's a limit on in lake formation. There's a limit of like 15 tags that you can uh, tag types, and you know, and it, then it's just you know the relationship between your tagging and your tables. Do you sort of create views or something like that with you know per tenant, um, and you know automate the creation of that, or you know, yeah, can you sort of do Role, uh, sorry, row-based um, access and things like that, and I would have to dive into the documentation a little bit, but I believe that that you know there has been some announcements around that. Uh, I guess, yeah, I guess you might be just worried that, you know, one client can see the other client's data, so, you know, yeah, probably has to be... <laughs> well, and, and again, it goes back to your testing and observability, so, you know, there's a big story around data tests these days. You can actually unit test whether, you know, assuming a certain role, you know, can you see only the data relevant to that particular user, client A versus client B sort of thing. So you can absolutely automate all of that stuff these days. So it's not just, you know, um, oh, I clicked a few buttons and hopefully it works, <laughs> you know. Okay. Yeah, nice. Need to do a talk. Any other questions? Well, thanks so much. That's where you can reach me if you do have any further questions. Um, that's it. I know this is probably a bit of a left field talk for a serverless meetup, but I thought, um, I think we're at this stage where it's not just talking about, um, you know, like how to build a serverless microservice or something like that. We want to really start um, discussing some of these other aspects of, of the tech. And um, so hopefully you've found this enjoyable, that it's worthwhile. And then, um, yeah, just ping me if you've got, um, don't just ping me if you've got questions on this. Ping me if you wanted to do a different talk that's kind of a bit of an extension on you know on you know the traditional serverless use cases because I'm always fascinated to you know hear what people are doing doing with serverless out in the wild. So thanks once again for coming. It's really great to see all your faces actually in person as well. So thank you. If you like, yeah. Did you uh, stop the live stream, Simon? <laughs>